You see, something's going to happen. What? What's going to happen? Something wonderful. What? I understand how you feel. You see, it's all very clear to me now. Welcome to the Occult Rejects. In this episode, I got my man Jin the Ninja with me co-hosting. Uh, shout out to uh, Lisa. She was supposed to join us today, but uh, unfortunately school called her in, so uh, that was, she will not be here, but she'll be here in the spirit. Um, but we got Jin the Ninja with us, and uh, you already know who he is, but just in case you don't, if this is your first time coming across the channel or the show, Jin, please let everybody know uh, what your deal is and what you're about. Sure. So uh, thank you, Nick, and a special shout out to Lisa. It is her birthday today, so we'll just I'll just uh, mention that. And uh, um, so I have my own show uh, when I'm not uh, co-hosting, although I am usually in a big group but with Nick, but today co-host. So uh, yeah, it's Threshold Saints. You can find me on Spotify and Apple, and uh, also on Twitter X uh, Wukong Reborn W U K O N G Reborn. Uh, yeah, check me out. I I just dropped a steiner episode like an hour ago and um uh <laughs> yeah there's you know there's lots upcoming and i'm doing uh these alternative history spaces on um saturdays at 7 40 uh, pacific eastern time um uh so it's we're calling them the aeon of the daughter and different t- sort of topics on history of magic and alternative theories of reality Awesome. Thank you so much, Jin. And uh, his all his links and you know stuff to go check out will definitely be in the show notes. Uh, and today, very, very special guest. Um, and, a, and an awesome story, too, kind of behind it. Um, you know, I had recently moved out to Long Island from Queens. And there was a store out there that I used to frequent all the time when I used to live out uh, in Queens because it was actually closer to me that way. And um, it was a magic store. And it's called The Time for Karma. I used to go out there a lot. Um, great store. I mean, amazing jewelry, knickknacks. I mean, all that stuff. There, my opinion, their stone collection is insane. Um, and you don't have to worry about buying anything fake if you go there. In my opinion, it's all real. Uh, and it's just, it's. I've always just liked going there. And um, I was like, you know what? I I think I DM'd them, and I was like, I wanted to, because uh, you know, I have stickers that I send out. That I've been sending out to uh, the Juggalos because uh, they know Darby O'Trill made some of the art, or just you know even the fans and listeners. I'm sending out uh, free stickers, so I was thinking about asking them if I could drop some off down there. And um, whoever answered the DM had said, "Oh yeah, we actually have a table. They had a little setup to you know put stuff down." So about a week later, I went back down. Uh, I went down there. And uh, I had met Jill, and I had uh, asked her if it was okay if I used one of the stands, because they already had, like, business card stands that you can even put your stuff in. And uh, I put the, the stickers there, and um, we started talking. Um, amazing woman, really nice. Uh, she told me that she wrote a book, and you already know how I am about books. Uh, I, like, I love having authors on. Um, I think it, it means something that people actually spent the amount of time it takes to write a book. Um, that takes a lot of passion and a lot of focus. And uh, I just, you know... I find that stuff admiring. So I like to get authors on. Um, and yeah, she told me that she has the uh, the book Mystic Spirit of Hollow's Eve. It's got the sacred stone in there, secrets of Sam Hain, psychic path, real ghost stories. And uh, I was going to have her talk about that. And um, But before we get into that, I would like to have her kind of introduce herself and, um, you know, let her, she's going to let you know everything that she does. She also does teach classes at this place as well. And again, it is a time for karma, and that's in uh, Rockville Center, if I am correct. I think that's the town it's considered in. Again, I highly suggest to go check that place out. But uh, Jill, um, we'll uh, bring you on now. Um, let everybody know, um, I guess, like, where they can find your stuff. I know you have Divine Insight, which is a new YouTube channel. Let everybody know what's up with that in your book, and um, please let them know about your stuff at uh, Time for Karma. Uh, great, sure. Hi, Nick. Hi, Jin. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, I do a lot of work on psychic phenomena. I have been studying different systems of divination and... Um, self-care, self-improvement for quite a while. And I teach classes at a time for karma 
um, coming up. I have several. I'm going to be doing a celebration of Halloween. Uh, that'll be occurring next week, early in the week. And then I have an introduction to crystals class and um, that'll be in November. And I also have a class on the root chakra. Um, I believe very strongly that that is the chakra that is the key to the entire system being aligned and working for your benefit. Uh, so I have a whole class on creating a great foundation within that. And um, so I also do readings there a couple of days during the week. Awesome. And um, I love to write. I'm also an avid reader. And so I had an opportunity to create Mystic. And a lot of what you'll find in the book was created by a very good friend of mine and a brilliant writer, uh, and his name is Sid Prince. And I do a lot more within this particular volume. I do a lot more of editing than writing, um, but there are some articles that I have written uh, within it. And um, I love learning. And so I find a lot of the spirituality-based topics absolutely fascinating. Mm. Yeah, I do. Uh, it's something that I've been wanting to try to get into more. Is instead of so much on the, uh, it's the intellectual side. I would like mm -hmm. to you know, start you know, delving into maybe a little bit more uh, spiritual ideas and topics. Mm -hmm. You got to have both, I think, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree, Nick. Yeah. Um, you know, some of those things that you mentioned, Tara, what's some of, the, if you don't mind me asking. Ask um, anything. And, I, and it, I guess, I mean, it really doesn't matter. But, like, uh, what's, like, some of your favorites? You know, like, that you, all those things that you said there that you did, like, what's some of the favorites that you really love, like, doing the most? Oh, the things I've studied? Or, like, what you do at the store. Like, you were saying, you know, some of the classes and things that you do or, or the other things, like, uh, like the things that you oh. offer. Like, what's some of the things that you, like, really love the most that you do? I love the crystal class. I feel that it's a lot of fun um, to show people how they can connect with the particular types of crystals, what the different shapes are, how you um, can find something to work with the purpose that you're looking for. Um, that is to say, if you're looking for something to help you feel courage, if you're looking for healing, um, different stones are more useful for the different purposes. What would you suggest for courage? For courage? Absolutely. I would say amethyst is a great stone. Nice. Um, I would also say carnelian is great. Jasper, especially nice. red jasper. Yeah, is I was going to say red. I was going to ask, what about red? Because I know red would go with like courage too. Like red, some red stones kind of. Abs there. Absolutely. Yeah. Nice. And if anybody wants a great stone for taking obstacles out of their path, black tourmaline is phenomenal for that. I had that. It's a great stone. And it does it in such a wonderfully gentle way. Other stones make it a lot more of a combative process. So the energy actually fights outward. I think tourmaline just does it on a very subtle, mellow level where it clears it. And I find it puts people at ease. Mm. That's good. That's so, close. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a benefit. <laughs> um, to to further answer you, I just did a class on working with your energy and figuring out how to bring that, how to bring your intention into um, manifestation. So to be able to attain what your goals are, um, there are different facets of it that people may not be familiar with. And uh, drawing those connections together 
adding information that people may not be aware of was just so incredibly cool to present it and to have that light bulb moment for several of the students where all of a sudden you could see it connecting. And the one thing that I didn't realize is how how excited people are going to get and then they're going to want to spend time talking about it. So it just took the energy to the next level within the class itself. It was amazing. Nice. Um, you know what? I, real quick, too, if you don't mind me, um, what even made you? What made you even get into this like stuff to begin with? I met a friend during college days, and she was really into it. She was going to the different psychic fairs and to the different classes around Long Island. And uh, she had invited me and she said, I just feel like you are very psychic and that you could really get into this and be very um, dynamic with it. And why don't you come with me to check it out? They're having an open house at one of the psychic places. Um, I don't remember the name of where this was. Um, but it was a series of, they had presentations. It was just an open house. And so they had 15 or 20 minutes on each topic. So somebody spoke about numerology. Somebody spoke about divination. Somebody spoke about sensing auras, I think. Um, and it was interesting. And I wasn't totally sure, but... I started to look into it. I started reading about it and talking more with my friend. And that just spurred such a strong instinct for it. Nice. You know what I wanted I wanted to ask you too, mm -hmm. since you're another practitioner. Um, and it's, you know, it's funny how like I, I well, I guess I, I do promote like doing shadow work and I guess meditation. I never really promote like rituals or doing you know, certain things. But um, as another practitioner, I do think that um, I'm just taking a guess. Sure. At how important meditation probably is for people who, who aren't, who haven't, haven't started practicing this stuff. I would assume you would even say meditation is a huge, huge part of the practice. I would absolutely say that you need to get still you need to have that quiet time some people do it through stretching and movement yeah. so they physical meditation they walking meditation yeah or people do yoga um some people do it with um releasing so at the end of a long day one of the practices that one of my teachers um does when he, because uh, he's also a reader and a teacher, um, pu very publicly. So he says he actually takes time while he's taking a bath or um, just resting at the end of the day um, to release all of the energy and get centered again. Sorry, Jill. I, I just wanted to say that I also uh, enjoy a long bath and I find it very, um, whether I add herbs or not or essential oils or not or, or whatever, um, I, I, I find that to be very helpful for me as well for decompression and just to sort of center myself. Even before sometimes I come on with Nick, I take a bath. Yeah, I should do a lot oh, of ritual wow. baths before rituals, obviously. <laughs> Oh, gentlemen, absolutely. Well, part of it is because water works at the elemental level of emotional energy. So how we connect to ourselves, how we connect with other people, um, this is very, very important as far as releasing what doesn't serve us. And... Um, when you work on self-defense and um, protection of your energy, one of the ways of doing that uh, at the level of emotions is to take that bath or 
you could even do it through drinking a glass of water and letting that water move through you and visualizing it as very purifying. Yeah. We were talking. Go ahead, Jen. I saw, I saw you unmute yourself. Go for it. Oh, no, no, no. That's okay, Nick. Go ahead. No, I was just like thinking a lot about how we even covered water as consciousness recently. Um, just even talking about water, there's so much behind water that I think like even with, you know, meditating like in the bath, like we're talking about that. I just do think there's probably so many benefits to that. Um, you know, even, I mean, even maybe outside, if you had a chance to maybe like somehow, I guess, meditate in water outside, I would even think that could even make a difference because of this, the information from the sun, the light being on that water. But um, for me, I've even wondered, this may sound like a little out there, but, and it's because of how, like, we are questioning if there's, like, consciousness in the water. Could that be, even be, like, a conduit to let yourself even slip out a little bit farther than, than normal? You know, uh, in a sense. I've, I've often water, wondered if water could I'm be, like, sorry. a conduit for other things. There is actually a wonderful uh, set of divination cards that were created by um there was a doctor named masaru emoto and he i saw him in a uh a video called what the bleep do we know <laughs> and it had come out ages ago this has to be easily 10 years or more ago and this doctor studied these um i believe he's a doctor and he, he wrote something called The Hidden Messages in Water. And he created this set of cards where he projected emotions onto the water and put a focus. He may have written the emotion and put it under a glass of water. And then he, fil he photographed the, um, the water in its molecular form he actually magnified it and looked at it and the way that the matrices of the water molecules formed based on the emotion that was being centered into it were very different um and they it would form these beautiful um lattices of almost like snowflakes and very very structured very symmetrical for the positive emotions and the negative emotions, uh, the crystals would be disrupted. This makes a lot of sense to me, Jill, because the water is in many ways like a living crystal, I think, is, is really what you're at the core and, and and like what Nick said like if you're outside or um, you know we I think all three of us live uh, in approximation to the ocean or close mm -hmm. by and so if you are in the kind of moving water it's moving and shifting the negative feelings away from you and then also you're receiving the positive benefits of the light like the sunlight like exactly what Nick said like the like the light sunlight through the living crystal through the water and then I also think of uh, Constantine the film with Keanu Reeves where he puts his feet into water in order to cross the abyss so I always think that's such an interesting um, mechanism that he just is slightly submerged into a, a tub of water so rather than you know a full submersion but he's able to sort of carry himself through a magical experience just with his intention the mythologist joseph campbell spoke about crossing water as a threshold into the next step of an adventure what you're saying, Jin, makes tremendous sense to me. That's interesting. The feeling well, of water. sorry, Nick, go ahead. No, I just like even when I, when I said that I, when I've had experiences, I thought I felt like water flowing through my body. It was very interesting. Mm-hmm. Wow, that's pretty cool. That was a nice little topic. I wasn't expecting to talk about water and consciousness. <laughs> it is uh, very cool. Yes. Um, was there anything, Jim, was there anything you wanted to say before maybe we start getting into the book? Not that I'm into it, not, not that I'm rushing to get into the book. But. 
Um, I mean, there, there's a lot. I, th- I feel like Jill is, is, has a, 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 a breadth and a depth of knowledge that I Yeah, I know. I'm like, no, maybe I want to know if there's any very, questions uh, I can very bring up. impressed <laughs> with. And I just, um, I have so many thoughts. But we'll continue on in, uh, yeah. you know, and, and whatever com- uh, whatever arises, I will <laughs> I will ask if it strikes. <laughs> oh, you know what, um, Jill, and you said yeah. you're also into tarot as well, right? I am. Nice. What kind of uh, decks do you use? I use the mythic tarot, which is based around Greek mythology. I grew up reading so many of those old myths, and I was just enchanted by it. And when I saw that deck, it called to me, and I've been reading that specific deck for over 30 years. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. That's a long time. Nice. Nice. Feels like a blink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll have to say uh, time is flying by now. Um, all right. So this, uh, what did you want to get into? Like the book, the Mystic Spirit of Hollows Eve. Um, what Happy made you even to- decide that? What do you mean? I'm sorry. What made you even decide to write that? Um, that believe it or not, that was Sid. That was so, my yeah, creative partner. Before, yeah. He had said, "Let's do something. Let's create." And did you ever just know that something was a yes and yeah, you have yeah. everything just aligns and you just know and you don't look back? Yeah. There's other times that you say yes to something and you may have the, oh, what did I get into? What did I just say yes to? Or, gee, maybe it wasn't a good idea. Um, this was not one of those. This, every step of the way... Um, I was so glad I did it. And um, it is, um, it was the idea of sharing spiritual knowledge, exploring metaphysical topics, and bringing something to people that would be very interesting and that they might like to know a little bit more about. Um, all right, so we got tarot. You into candle magic? A little. I was just wondering. I'm trying to think of like some of the other things. What is some of um? I'm not, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I just want to give the listeners, you know. No, it's all good. I, it's ideas all good. of what people do. What, I don't what, have what, to do it. It's just not something I do as much of. Gotcha, gotcha. What would be like your daily magical routine? Okay, so (laughs) in the morning, I get up, and I stretch and center, and I try to really get aligned. So um, centering into focusing on what uh, could make the day extraordinary. It's not that everything has to be purely perfect and wonderful and roses and sunshine, but trying to just stay focused. Um, I like, I've heard a variation. Um, One of my teachers is named Mark Lyons, and he's absolutely brilliant. Um, And he adapted, uh, he he calls it a good good morning prayer. And I'm going to paraphrase it because I, I absolutely love it. And I don't have his exact wording, but I have the way I do it. And so I say, please, God, show me what it is I'm supposed to do, where it is I'm supposed to go, what it is I'm supposed to say, and to whom. Because within myself, I can only do so much. But with your guidance and grace, I would like to be truly helpful. And then the underlying thought is I want my life to count for something. I want to have fun and do really cool things. And I want to try to avoid things that are unnecessary or unhappy or misery provoking. So I don't always know, but please help me to stay out of the way of shenanigans. I like that. that. (laughs) You like that? Yeah, no, no. I just, I like the whole, uh, I mean, you know, when I first started out doing stuff, I did like a lot of either meditation mm-hmm. or trying to center myself or, or giving like a goal or like I kind of what you said, I, I understood that. And I do think that can actually um, 
I do think that makes a difference in your personality. It can. You know, just your whole outlook on the day can change just from doing that. And I try to do, after I do that, I put in, well, right before I do the prayer, I usually do something to create a bit of uh, spiritual self-defense in terms of just centering myself into my energy and um, protecting the outer edges so that the things that happen in life, it's not that you're not trying to have experiences throughout your day, but you're trying to avoid negativity or trying to avoid things that won't serve you. So Jill, let me ask, um, because a lot of the occultists that Nick has had on in the past, they don't always have um, such a God-centric orientation, we'll, we'll call it. And I, I personally love that. I love that you centered, especially the theme of loving kindness. Um, uh, the, Nick and I both love like the Kabbalah quite a, a lot, so we so that I think it resonates with both of us in in that um, sort of theme. But what are how do you um, reconcile? We'll say having a magical outlook as well as uh, maybe a faith in God. I know that's a hard question, but I don't find it hard at all, Jen. Um, you know Kabbalah, so you know. The, um, the the upper levels, of course, is uh, the highest level is Kether, which is the god in pure form. Um, and then there's Bina, and is it, um, I want to say Chakma, but I'm not sure if I'm correct about yes, that. Chokma, yeah, Chokma, Chokma, yeah. Um, and yes, and so that's divine masculine, divine feminine energy. I truly believe that although from the patriarchal side of things in, within religion and looking at God as the, the very masculine energy, I truly believe that the divine feminine, whether you look at it as uh, Shekinah, the feminine spirit, or um, Bina as the divine feminine, you need the masculine, you need Chakma to have the force to drive forward, to um, create a, um, I think of it in terms of the, the force of an idea, the force of creating something, the male energy. And if you look at it in a sexual metaphor, it's the seed, it's the sperm, it's the seed of the idea. Um, and then the female is where it becomes form. So you have the force and the form, which are um, within that feminine, she gives the parameters. So for anybody who's really old school, who goes back to the... Um, the Wonder Twin powers on the um, the Super Friends. I don't want to be cheesy about it, but they actually would say shape of this, form of that. And it's this generative force where you're bringing in um, uh, the, the feminine end of it shapes everything. She births the idea into existence and gives it a finite form. So... Um, both of them are incredibly valuable and um, they have an equivalency. Yeah, I think uh, both are needed regardless. Like, yeah. I'm getting off my soapbox now. No, 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 you're Sorry. fine. No, no, that was great. That was great. No, I like it. Thank you. No, I, I definitely... Uh, to get into it, sometimes you always say, oh, yeah, well, one's more important than the other one, but I do think like just like you, you need both and you ain't going to make anything happen. <laughs> yeah, I got you need, you. yeah you need to acknowledge both and they're both very uh very divine in their own way absolutely yes like you like you stated um there was something i was going to ask you and then i got lost all right continue i'm sorry no don't be sorry <laughs> um jen did you want to ask anything um, no, that was a really great answer. So thank you, Jill, for uh, fielding my question. Um, I'm honored. 
also, if uh, if you wanted to, you don't have to say what you do specifically, but if you have any tips for psychic self-defense for anyone listening, I know that a lot of people do struggle with this. I know I get a lot of DMs personally about this, and uh, any helpful hints you can share, I think, would be well-received. There are some really good books that I have read from. One that I really like is Christopher Penzak's uh, book, The Witch's Shield. You don't have to be Wiccan or Pagan or call yourself a witch. Um, I think that if you can get past the name, the information in there is so incredible And when we spoke earlier about water and about how it relates and how the emotional space that you need, that hygienic cleansing of your emotional levels that way, he talks a lot about that. I learned so much from reading it, and he's got some great techniques in there. Um, For myself, uh, I try to surround myself with Um, with light and make sure that um, I'm keeping my energy very um, clearly. I put a boundary between myself and the outer world that way. um, I think that a lot of people walk around very raw and I think that their hair triggered very easily because um, they don't have that ability to center within themselves and put that little bit of a barrier. I'm not talking about getting into plate mail armor, although for some people, if you need it in the moment, there are times that things get overwhelming. And um, for me personally, when I encountered one of them, In those moments, I try to reach out very creatively and visualize what I need. And believe it or not, I saw it as scuba gear. So I felt like I was drowning. And in that moment, it's like visualize, it was visualizing the gear around me, allowing me to breathe easily and to just put a barrier between myself and the elements. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you so much. That is that's really good advice. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, I remember for me when I was like, um, you know, when I was like active with doing a lot of like ritual work. Uh, I think every morning I would do like kind of a meditation, and then sometimes I would work on my chakras, and then I would do. Uh, I guess, I mean, I don't know if this, I guess this might be considered psychic self-defense. I would do the leper, lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram every morning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would do that. So uh, You read the same book I did, because that's the other book, the um, psychic self-defense and well-being. I believe they have it in there. Uh, um, you know what? Just from being in the OTO, I was already pre- pre-exposed to the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. Begin with. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I do know who who that uh, that author was though that you mentioned. I have also they also have psychic sense self defense. I think Dion Fortune has a book on that as well that I heard is good. Yes, absolutely. I read that ages and ages ago when I first started out. So yeah, yes, I've heard I've heard good things about it. I had I might have had the book on PDF and never really went through it, but um, I she's have heard brilliant. Good things. Her book on Kabbalah. Oh, Mystic Kabbalah good. is amazing. Mm-hmm. It is. That's where I learned what little I know so far. That's oh, that's where a great start, though. Yeah, you know she what I got to do. I have a, I have a PDF for another book. I should email it to you. It goes into the paths as well. Not too many books cover the paths. It's a huge. I would book. really appreciate. Oh, that. I, it's a it's a gem in my opinion. For the path cool. work, it's it's great for paths. Cool. Yeah. Um. All right, so, like, was that, like, kind of, not to keep going into it, but, like, um, I know for some people you might have, like, an afternoon or a night thing, but, I mean, was that was that kind of, like, what your, your whole thing is? That's pretty much what I do. Okay. By the afternoon right. and night, I'm being pulled in so many directions. If I don't do it in the morning, then Stop. I'm doing wrap. it as a catch-up, <laughs> and you always want to get ahead. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I relate to this very strongly. I start my day with sadhana. Um, if I don't, my day is quite off 
like I feel it all day. And, and then, but if, if there's an astrological uh, lunar phase, because we use a lunar calendar, usually yeah, I, there are times where I have to do nighttime uh, rituals, but I generally try and do it every morning, like 10 minutes after I'm awake. So I relate to this very strongly, Jill. Got you. Yes, absolutely. Jen. Yo, you know what I used to also do? Resh. I forgot about that. That's something I used to do every morning and uh, throughout the day. It's like a prayer that I think Crowley created or something. Well, somebody told me, Nick, that um, there's a uh, sort of three-syllable sound that I I forget it's Golden Dawn or OTO, but they they recite it. And I was thinking, wow, that's so similar to exactly what we do because we do the Om Ah Hong. Like that's our like kind of like initial beginning prayer it's the white the red and the blue and you're visualizing them in your Mm. energy centers (laughs) like the specific ones and then you're kind of bringing it in to heart center self-combusting it and then sort of uh, visualizing it glow i guess glow from within you nice i do like uh you know that's it's interesting a lot of things that i ever did uh with visualizations you know i used multiple different outlets or you know uh, books or things online it seems the red, white, and blue seems to be a constant, like, uh, color scheme that is mm-hmm. used, you know, it's those colors. I find that interesting. I wonder if that means, you know, if that actually helps with activating, like, certain things with the back of your eyes. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Having certain colors or cones used. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with that. I mean, as a, a fan of your eye series, I, I, I thought that when you guys discussed it, about the cones and, and even like the green and how green is kind of like the harmonious balance. And it can also be the will, the projection outwards. And I mean, yeah, the red, white, and blue are the fun, fundamental colors of our reality really. So I, I think it means it's very meaningful. Uh, uh. Um, I have, I have so many, it's like Jill will start talking about things. And it'll make me think of other questions and then I'll forget. Okay. There's, there's like so many like questions that I'm like, fuck, I really need to take advantage of it. And now it's like escaping me because there's really not too many times where I have like somebody on that I could like actually like question a lot about their practices and what they're into. So, uh, uh, um, all right. Yeah. So, okay. You did mention meditation. Um, do you have any, um, do you have any experience in any like actual ritual stuff? There have been times in the past, I've really gotten away from it now, but in the past, I was part of, actually, I was part of several different groups where we did um, very spiritually eclectic work, and um, for the major holidays along the lines of the pagan holidays, we would get together and honor it, celebrate it, work on things um, of that nature, for sure. Uh, A a question that just came to mind now that, um, I mean, just, I guess just to, I think I pretty much know what kind of answer I'm going to get, but just, you know, maybe for the listeners to understand, or if there's new people coming across this stuff that, maybe it has the wrong idea about magic or occultism, witchcraft. Um, what is the reasoning or the benefits, the reasoning and the benefits that you get out of what you do? I think that it is all about using the energy to move you closer to what you are what your intention is what you're trying to create what you want to let go of and repel from you it's very magnetic and to bring yourself into alignment with these forces with these energies helps to um enhance speed up, increase um, the the intention of it, the goal of it. I yeah. hope that that's making sense. I'm not sure yeah. if I am right now. No, that's great. that's great. Do you think it's, do you think due, due to magic and witchcraft, your life has gotten better? In some senses, I think it's you know? Fun. Like... I think it's fun. I think it's exciting. I think it's powerful and I think it's potent. And I do think that the insights 
that I've gotten. If you said to me, what's been the, the one biggest benefit? I grew up where magic was fairy tales. Magic was Disney. Magic was um, the Steven Spielberg movies and yeah. episodes of TV shows. Um, when he did the one in Amazing Stories about um, the the fighter plane and that they were in danger and one of them was not going to make it and holding to belief if they could just do what they had to do um, to make things work, to bring a victory, to save um, uh, to save a life, to help, and to make a difference. That always struck me as it resonated so deeply. And from the time I was little, I always felt that there was something to this that went beyond just a story. And when I found out, when my friend invited me and I started looking into it, and finding that there is that power, there is that connection, it just became incredibly fun. And I took to it very deeply. Um, and I find that it serves. I find that when you listen to that small voice, when you have that intuition, do this, don't do that, it can change everything. I definitely think. Has it made, like, for me, well, well, for me, have you noticed throughout your practices, mm -hmm. um, you know, as long as you've been doing it, has your ideas and theories about, like, God or even spirituality changed over and over and over again? Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. Um, I grew up very, uh, in, in very patriarchal religious terms, believing God was a singular form, God was masculine, a woman has certainly to be honored, and um, there's reverence for the feminine, but know your role and hush to a certain extent. It is the be powerful where you're powerful, but otherwise know your role. And finding a space where women are exalted and then reading uh, When God Was a Woman by Merlin Stone, reading The Chalice and the Blade by Rain Eisler changed everything for me. Reading, well, and even before that, I discovered Joseph Campbell and comparative mythology when I was I want to say 19 or 20, and it was like living in a tiny little space and the whole world opening up around me. It was exhilarating. And um, understanding how um, mythic imagery is so connective across the world that there are elements that everybody knows of the major archetypes and the hero's journey that all cultures from the beginning of human history have experienced these things that it resonates and relates back and forth. It was such a tremendous revelation to me. And I've always loved mythology. I've always loved stories. So finding that connection was phenomenal. And then learning that not everything that I was taught was complete um, made a huge difference uh, there again. You say learning, relearning, unlearning, going through it, finding out that there were places where the culture was very different where women had power and some held it as a flip to the patriarchy where the matriarchy was just as dominant and controlling and just as uh, insufferable in some ways. 
And then there were other cultures that were based around partnership and collaboration where women held power in a very different way. Um, they say ancient Crete was different in that regard, that women were dominant, but not, I shouldn't use the word dominant. Um, they held power, but they didn't uh, use it in a, in a controlling manner. Just to follow that up, Jillian, you sort of touched on it already, but mm -hmm. do you believe in perennialism or do you think that there is a perennial system that is spans? Uh, obviously Nick's laughing because he knows this is a very big question of mine is that, is there a system that tra sort of transcends geographic boundaries, transcends like the religious traditions, maybe is secret or, or is just un or forgotten or sleeping or, or anyways, I'll, I'll let you answer that. But I, I just, it's very uh, interesting to me because you bring up Joseph Kennedy Campbell and I just think, well, I'm not personally a universalist, but there is something that he's speaking on that is very profound. I do believe that it's possible. I believe that I know so little when it comes to, you know, the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. And the more I've studied, I do believe that it is possible that, um, what word did you use? Perennialism? Mm-hmm. It's from grandma, but it, you know, it, it can just refer to a system that was maybe the primordial, or uh, as many people say, as Mario from Symbolic Study so says, the hyperborean system that we sort of inherited, and then um, we've all sort of uh, mutated it or taken it into its own direction, and and sort of uh, you know, every culture has kind of taken a piece of it, and but there's something that connects all of them anyway. Oh, for definite, I believe that. And I do believe that we morph it and change it as we ourselves adapt and evolve as we're moving forward. I'm also not sure, but I would like to believe that it's possible that there are parallel uh, universes uh -huh. and that maybe in another one, we don't live in a system that's so broken there that maybe we figured it out and moved past treating other people like commodities oh. and taking a uh, profit over people. And I don't, I'm not anti-capitalism. I don't mean it that way. I'm anti-abuses. Yeah. Anti yeah, totally. Yeah. I totally get that though. Totally different thing. Right? Like, yeah. You don't even have to be getting like, Political is just boundaries that get crossed regardless. You mm -hmm. know, <laughs> absolutely. Just, there's just humans regardless the way things are, we treat each other. There's boundaries that are being crossed. That shit. May I expand on some of it sure. a little bit? Yeah, sure, sure. So, um, I was when I was learning a bit about the chakras. One of the topics that made sense to me within that was the idea that chakras are evolutionary steps and so as we move forward in time as we develop as human beings or if you want to say spiritual beings having a human experience um the idea is that we've gone through like rising up over the levels of each chakra so in the prehistoric and this comes from anodia judith's book wheels of life and, great book, um, great book. I ha I've suggested that book for the show. On the show, man. It's a good book. Yeah, or, or I, that is the book that whenever I've probably shown stuff on chakras, it's probably been from that lady's book. Um, She was pretty brilliant with a lot of what she shared in it. I think she definitely, I think that lady is very intelligent and has had some amazing experiences. Absolutely. And I like her idea, this is hers, the idea of evolutionary stages so prehistoric um, Ice Age cavemen times were a uh, root chakra level, all about survival, figuring out how to get your basic needs met. So if you look at the Maslow hierarchy, food, clothing, shelter, and um, sustenance, safety, survival. And then 
in the age of exploration, it became um, all about the second level, which is sacral. And it's interesting because we built boats, we being the planet, we built boats and made a lot of water crossings. And the sacral chakra is so deeply connected with water and emotions and uh, relationships predominantly on the one-to-one level. And um, then I think that we are now living through the uh, solar plexus level of power and how do we hold power and do we do it as power over other people or do we do it as internal strength and um, holding power in a way where we own our own strength and we are gentle, generous, and otherwise um, in control, but without the need to control other people around us. I like that. And I see it as working on all the whole, um, the problems that we're experiencing of money over people, the problems of dominating and making war and um, what was the Jimi Hendrix quote? Um, when, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. And so that's going to fourth chakra to the heart level where there's the more of a universal love, more of a compassion, more of a kindness, more of a benevolence on a grander level than the one to one. Even I'm not saying they're incompatible. I think that they're intrinsically linked, but the the heart chakra is much more about Christ consciousness, love, um, generosity of spirit, as opposed to the uh, sacral, which is much more about relating to other people much more directly. Yeah. This is great. That that was really... (laughs) I'm like, we'll we'll get to the book at some point. Oh, no, I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining either. I was just like sitting here. I was like, wow, this is great. We're talking about chakras. I'm thrilled. (laughs) I'm thrilled. Uh, Jin, did you have something you wanted to say? Sure. I just have two really quick things before we start the book. But um, I I, I thought that was really beautiful, Jill. Like when you explain like how going through history is a thergic process. Like you, like man is forging himself through the different historical ages I don't know if you're familiar with this historian called Carl Jaspers. He writes a lot on early Buddhism and how Buddhism is a axial age religion is sort of a religion that appears at the rise and the fall of civilization. And so it is sort of like a, he, he would call it a civilizational axis in the, in the sense that it propels man to reach that heart center of bodhicitta or loving kindness, exactly like, how you described like bringing it into the heart chakra like what we need expansive infinite compassion and love but it's it's beyond that uh like the what we would call the dakinis realm which what you described is like she lives there so we would say she lives there and she's kind of our love our interpersonal love with other people but then when you move up it is become it's just a lot more expansive it's a lot more um maybe there's an intellectual component to it where we're able to uh, separate our personal feelings out from just like general goodwill so i i just wanted to say that i thought that was really great thank you i love what you just said too jen that was very very cool well, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, I, I personally like a bit of a perennialist, so it, it, it all seems to make sense to me. And um, whether we're talking historical or um, biological or spiritual, I feel like there's a system there that, you know, is understandable or discernible if you if you just listen and, and, and sort of hear the similarities. Absolutely. Very well said. Well said. It's just why I have you on. <laughs> <laughs> it is well said. Thank you. Sir. 
Um, and, and I'm not complaining at all because I'll, I'll even be honest with you. A lot of times when I have authors on, just for the simple fact, I'll, be, I'll keep it real. You don't want to go through the whole book because you do want to um, hope some people buy it. So, uh, yep. you know, <laughs> I don't want you to go on too much about it, actually. But um, would you like to finally get into it? Even if we only spend like 10 or 15 minutes, that's fine. But if you would like to talk a little bit, uh, you know, about this book that you are. You, yeah, you, absolutely. So it's a lot of explorations. It's very accessible to beginners. We wrote it really uh, to open the topics. So there's some details. There's several excellent nuggets of wisdom and great information. Um, I am very uh, delighted with the way that um, Sid has explained the 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 um, the tarot, uh, the major arcana as a journey through life, and it's. A, a take that I haven't seen with other decks and other uh, books. Um, so within what he created for explaining, it really gives a lot about how to, how to perceive the journey that you're on in ways where you have to come to terms with the forces within the forces that are external and how frequently it's a matter of doing your best and then looking back and using the 2020 vision of hindsight to determine, okay, am I going forward? Am I going backwards? Where am I and what do I need to know and do? And when you look at all the archetypal uh, imagery within the, these uh, cards, there's so much room to create um, a, a connection with what your intentions are and where you're heading. Um, and so that alone was fascinating to read uh just as an editor of the book that was fascinating um the there's a great article about uh real ghost tales and not only does it talk about the the need for the psychic self-defense if you're going to explore these topics as far as going out and doing any ghost hunting or even if you are a person who looks at exploring, communicating, and connecting with the spiritual realm. The first step really needs to be how you shield yourself and how you prepare and protect. Because if you need to call upon it when something is happening, it's already too late. As far as the article goes, and um going on from there looking at and especially coming into halloween um a lot of people get curious about this topic especially around this time of year um what are the spirits what is happening in on that realm in that realm um where some of them may be people who have passed on and have crossed uh, through the the veil some of them may be spirits that don't know that they've passed and so they're still knocking around on earth but they're discarnate now some of them may have an agenda whether it's positive or negative so the more that you can become aware um, the better off you will be if this is something that you're interested in exploring Nice, nice. Um, do, do you have, is this the only book that you have? So far, I'm working okay. on several. I'm actually working on some books about the chakras, but I don't, I don't feel they're complete yet. Oh, I think we might have spoken about them. Yes. I think we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to make sure it's perfect. 
<laughs> well, it's got to be good enough, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's got to pass. You know, there's a level of, I mean, perfection is the enemy of done. And Are you I proud of it? I think that's what it is, right? Are you proud of it? Well, yeah, absolutely mm. so. Um, I keep telling... Um, I keep telling Sid that he should be writing more books about the different topics that he knows because um, he knows so much about tarot. He knows so much about looking through a very unique lens. He, he understands um, that it, it, about um, the unseen, the I'm trying to find the words to explain Um the ideas of there's more out there than we may be aware of and how how do we really know sometimes because a lot of people take in knowledge they read about something they learn about it or they're brought up a certain within a certain system Mm. and they never look any further um the the answer is the answer and there's never further explanation. And what I love about the way that he writes is, well, what does this actually mean? How do, what if we haven't fully explored this concept yet? And is there a lot more that we can discuss and that we can understand? And then how can that be beneficial? How can you take what you're learning and use it not only to help yourself, but to create better for the world around you? I like that. I mean, that's what... I like that too. Yeah. Jen, was you going to say something or no? Yes, I actually had two uh, quick questions. Is that, Jill, do you have an archetypal major arcana that you particularly identify with or just really like or feel like is very relevant right now and then secondly do you have a substance or crystal that you uh like uh for cleansing uh spiritual we'll say the external spirits away for definite um, when you asked about the archetype Jim, do you mean that i think is important right now as far as all of us, or for me personally, as my connective energy? Uh, any any that you're uh, comfortable and willing to share, I think would I think people is interesting. I always find it interesting when Nick talks about tarot because it's not my system. So, but I always find very deep connections to like the symbology, the you know, obviously the Kabbalah, the the numbers and and the colors. I just I feel like it. There's something very relevant about it. So, any any that you're open to sharing? Sure, absolutely. I know numerologically we're going from an eight year to a nine year. And I know that that's nines are wrap ups. So we're moving into a time where a lot of what we're dealing with is going to come to a close point. Um, And I am truly hoping and I try to put it out there as much as I can through prayer and intention that the world will grow in a positive way that things will turn more peaceful, less chaotic, less stressful. Um, So that's the starting point as far as numerically, since you brought up that you're into that. Um, As far as the archetype right now, I've been focusing around the star. I think that we are going through, especially because this time of year we're going more toward darkness we're going towards the a time when we have more uh literal night than daytime and so um we are looking at um a time when that little bit of light in the darkness even if it's like holding up a torch where You may only be able to see the next step ahead of you, but having something that sustains you and having that faith and hope, a lot of hope because that's the star, 
that things will move forward well. Um, I try to key into that energy all the time, especially when I'm setting intentions so that I can anchor in that positive outlook because belief is such a strong piece of it. And um, without that, if you don't, it, it makes a huge difference. Um, and uh, I'm going to quote again, and this time I believe it was Henry Ford who said, if you think you can do a thing or think you can't, you're right. Say that, course, say that one more time. If you think you can do a thing or think you can't, you're right. Yeah. It's really, you have to think it. You have to believe it. There's, yeah, there's even stuff like that that uh, I had noticed to, to do to, I guess, really like magical practices, I guess, when you start looking at yourself. Yeah. How easily you can already predetermine the situation or the outcome just from your initial self talk. Oh, it's it's essential. Yeah. Belief, um, and I this was part of my energy class. Belief, um, having knowledge to underlie what you're trying to do or whatever your goal is. Um, the more you know about yourself, the more you know about what you're getting into. And so if you're talking about ritual, learning about what you're trying to accomplish, learning techniques, learning about the, um, the tools and the um, connections that they have as far as um, looking for a word. Um, correspondences um it that lends you a tremendous foundation in what you're trying to do having the faith and the belief in what you're doing being very intentional with your words um working from working from that point of will that solar plexus energy where you have your determination and your focus and lasering in on it um those pieces of it are key this is very hermetic from what i understand as far as what the hermetic magical systems taught Absolutely. Uh, Jen, you have anything? I just, I felt like that was quite profound and, and, and uh, it does remind me of Barden and it does remind me also of um, when you said about the star card, I just think, wow, that's so interesting because I, uh, that's also one of my favorite cards and I know Nick really likes the number 17 and yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's like something we're all kind of thinking about and I just thought, wow, that's mm -hmm. really interesting that we're kind of congregating around the same idea, but in, you know, three different people, three different systems. So I think there's, yeah, there's something to that. And, and, um, you know, uh, there's an idea of that faith opens up Netzach, uh, faith opens up Venus. Like, up, of course. Right. So it makes her receptive to hearing our will. So I, I just think that's the, yeah, there's something really interesting about that as well. Definitely. Well, thank you very much, Jen. Uh, Jill, was there anything? May I do a couple more? Sure. I was going to ask you, was there anything that you would like to bring up or say yourself? Well, just to tell you about Mystic, about um, the book, yeah. there's, there's a couple of other articles. We call it articles because we designed it as a magazine, although it's book format. Um, there's one about the nature of time and what time, what, what really is it and <laughs> is does it move the way we think and um, how to, how to look at it um, differently. Um, there's another article in here about, hang on a second. I'm going to find what I'm looking for. 
uh, about the the powers of the jinn and um, the the idea of making a wish and um, what if what if you could access the energy of a genie to grant the wish and looking at how how you would go about it and how to make good decisions and to be very aware of what you're wishing for. Um, it dovetails in with everything you were asking me about the, the nature of, uh, just give me a second, I'm going to find the words I need. Um, that idea of intention, when you talk about ritual, when you talk about magic, I think that a lot of times, starting with that knowledge, starting with that awareness of what you truly want, it really does come down to what do you want and why do you want it? Mm. And I think it dovetails beautifully into um, the um, that particular uh, um, article. Oh, I said, yeah. Have there ever been times that you've ever gone to like try to get like um, you've like gone to like kind of check your intentions and decided not to do it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And there have been times. And that that it was even harmful. I just realized it was just overly selfish at that point. Not just that, but there are times. How many? How many times have you said? And certainly. Um, we all know people who've done it where somebody is head over heels and you're looking and you're like, I don't think that's the right person for you. I don't have a good vibe about it. And it's the, no, 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 this is great. This is going to work. And it turns out, no, not so great. Yeah. You know, so it's definitely, that's just watching friends, relatives, um, I'm not going to say myself because uh, I just don't want to go there, yeah. but um, absolutely looking at a job that maybe was not the correct one or a um, wanting something and then realizing later um, it's not, it really wasn't a good idea. And having that experience, having that wisdom to say, no, I don't want to do that. And I've always tried within my magic and within my practices to be very careful about honoring um, that idea of only doing something that is really for the good of all. Um, I definitely, and it harmed none. Right. So it's one thing to say, um, because you can get so altruistic that you stop yourself from attaining anything. Yeah. I don't believe that's that's a good way to do it either uh, to go through life. But there are times that if this is truly going to be if this is going to be truly helpful, if this is meant for me, then let me flow towards it. Let it work. Um, take any obstacles out of my path for definite. If I don't feel like it's the wise thing, um, I won't do it. I like that. And, th- and thank you for your honesty, too. Absolutely. Uh, what's up, Jen? I saw you took the mic on. <laughs> well, I, you know, I don't want to breathe or do anything loud on, on, on mic, but yeah. and what I want to, you know, I want everyone to hear Jill and what she's saying. I think it's very profound. Yeah. I think that especially the point about not over applying mercy, like not like having that Gavura, having that sort of restriction, you're, you're, you're in balance, you're in synthesis. So you're pulling it back. So you're not overextending the application and, but you are controlling it and you might still keep it in your heart and your mind, but you're still in control of it. Your will, you're holding on. You're not, it's, you're not, you know, you're not pushing yourself outside of yourself. So I, I really love that. Thank you. Yes. I think you said it very well. I think you heard me. 
Um, was there anything else about the book that you wanted to cover? Um, I don't know what else to tell you about. I think no, I just that... there's nothing that like I didn't want you to be leaving anything out that you wanted to mention on the show. Oh, I thank you. Yeah, that's fine. Um, I think it's a lot of fun. I think that there's some very nice information about Samhain or Halloween, as it's called. I think um, that there are um, there's a lot of profound questions within a number of really within most of the chapters. There are several that are focused on great places on Long Island where you can find crystals and other magical items to that you can work with uh, supplies and tools. Um, we tended to focus around crystals because they're so much fun and they're so easy to work with and people don't have to be into the magical elements. Um, in fact, there's a lot of people who can be very devoutly religious or very secular who find that they just enjoy having them. And even those people who are not into magic uh, can pick up on the energy of the stone. Um, and in fact, I know, Jane, you'd asked me a good stone for this time of year. Um, I'm leaning in on smoky quartz right now. I'm leaning in on that grounding energy, that um, healthy healing energy. And um, also, I, I like black obsidian. I think that it could be very potent. I find that around this time of year, moving into root chakra energy around Samhain, around Halloween, um, black obsidian is a great stone. It could be very, very powerful um, because it's no nonsense. It's really that kind of ruthless compassion of telling you what you may, you may not want to hear it, but you may need to hear it. It's that on an energetic level. And I find that it's a tremendous resource. It's so interesting, Jill, that you brought up the black obsidian because where I live is an old volcanic cone. So if I go to the beach, I, I wildcraft these ch huge chunks of black obsidian. And actually, I'm sitting in my office right now, and there's a, I will say, a snake-like structure that I've put on someone's old train, like they the person who lived here before had like a train that went around the room. So I put the, I put the black obsidian. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's pretty cool. That's well, I mean. if you're asking me, Nick, about within the book, there's oh. um, there's several mentions of places like A Time for Karma, Breathe. Nice. There's a place out in Bohemia called the Sacred Stone. And all three of them have these phenomenal crystals. And within the book, we put a bunch of pictures so you could see them. And um, um, so if people want to know more about them, um, I, I don't even know what else to tell you besides um, I strongly encourage. Um, I strongly encourage finding, if you're into crystals, finding ones that work for you. And um, I like going to a place and actually checking them out as opposed to finding them through a remote resource. Yes. Like I had said before, um, just so you know, it just has, it not paying me to say this. <laughs> I'm just no, being honest. Sure. A time for karma. Uh, you know, I said I, I used to go there a lot for my uh, my stones and crystals, and uh, not that I've ever, not so much in New York, but there has been places that I have bought stuff from that. Listen, maybe the, even the owner doesn't even know, but I do think that unfortunately, that stuff can be like um, fake sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just it is what it is. I think we all know this. Um, that place, I would have no question that I was buying something real. So. 
I, I have my favorite malachite, fibrous malachite, uh, green malachite. Beautiful piece came from that store. I know for a fact that thing is real. <laughs> and um, it was a long yeah. time ago too. It was like I think it was like a rare. It was kind of like a rare one that I don't. I think they, they just had, and I was like, I need that. Yeah, it looked it looked like green velvet. I love that. Yeah. Sometimes they just call to you, and you just know that it's the right thing. And I, um, I've lived in the area, and I've shopped from there quite a bit before I got involved with working there. And um, it is, um, they're they're just easy to talk to. They're knowledgeable, and their stuff really is real. So, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you know what? They've always been nice in that store too. As, as long as I've been going there, always been nice people. Oh, it's absolutely. Shop, yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess, like, if you don't mind, I mean, unless there was anything you wanted to add to the show, I, I think we could probably wrap it up here, if that's okay. Um, I think that's fantastic. Unless you have any more questions for me. Do you, Jen? Because I'm good at this point. I, I, I'm really good, but I appreciate that Nick asked me on, and I appreciate your time, Jill, and I thought I learned stuff, so thank you so much. I appreciate it. Likewise, for me, I learned a lot, and this has been such a tremendous pleasure. I thank you both. Of course, of course. And if you pl- uh, want to, please let all the listeners know again where they can find your stuff and your new YouTube. Don't forget that. Oh, um, my, my YouTube is Divine Insight, and um, I only just started it a couple of days ago, so I'll be adding more to it. I want to explore a lot about tarot and oracle cards, chakras and energy work. I want to do a whole bunch of interviews and podcasts with great practitioners and other seekers and um, who love to learn about the metaphysical um and it's been phenomenal so that's divine insight and if you see my icon on the screen then that right now right now is my uh page icon so you know i'd love for anybody who wants uh to know more to check it out yes there you go and i will leave the show uh i'll leave links in the show notes for all of her stuff when this drops. Um, Jill, thank you so much for coming on. I mean, I'm sure there's definitely a reason I can have you on again in the future. There was a lot of times that you actually took me off guard and I wasn't, like, even expecting to have this conversation, these types of conversations with you, honestly. So that's why I might have been like, uh, because uh, it was really good. No, but it was, was, I really enjoyed this. Uh, Some some pretty deep stuff and uh, some, we touched on so many different topics. I appreciate that. Uh, and Jin, thank you very much, man, for co-hosting. It's always great to have your insight. Again, uh, you're into stuff I'm not, so it's always love. You know, I love seeing your angle. Appreciate it, Jin. And let thank everybody, you. and let everybody know where they can find your stuff again. Sure, I'm uh, well. Twitter and or X, Wukong Reborn, to be U K O N G Reborn. Instagram, Threshold Saints. It's it's the show account. Um, uh, it just dropped a signer episode with um, a quite uh, infamous and a very cool friend, uh, Alex uh, Harper from Baleful Rays, who is the Twitter astrologer. Pretty she uh, he is the. <laughs> He does the show, and it's a kind of a quiz matchup show, and they take different uh, people's astrology charts, and they try and figure out what the person does and, and like, all their life paths, and then they kind of uh, – people vote on it at the end. So it's a, it's a, he, it's a, he's a really cool dude, and it was a really great experience. So then thank you, Nick, and thank you, Jill, for, uh, you know, tolerating my <laughs> questions, and, uh, yeah. You're a pleasure, and maybe one day I could have both of you gentlemen come on my channel and we could do some discussing of one of these topics, maybe Kabbalah, maybe chakras. Either one. I could talk hours about either one. I love that. That would be a pleasure for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We could definitely make that happen. We could talk about that over here too in the future. Um, Thank you again, Jill. Like I said, it was really really, uh, an interview that I didn't expect. In many ways, <laughs> you know, when I walked into the store, I wasn't expecting all this to happen. Um, and even the way it went, uh, I really thought we touched on a lot of really interesting topics and ideas and thoughts. Um, and I'd like to at least uh, ho- hope to talk to you more again in the future. 
real. That would be a pleasure. Absolutely. Yes. And uh, yeah, that is the end of another Occult Rejects. And until the next one, everybody be well. Later. <laughs>